Hey, my name is Steve Jablonski, and I'm happy to be here to talk with Kaya about Transformers, maybe. Uh, some people know me for that, uh, and other things I've done. I, I write music for movies and other stuff. Uh, so I'm here to answer whatever crazy questions Kaya has for me. Steve, thanks so much for, sure. for inviting me to your studio and then chatting. Please. It's so great oh, to nice. do this in person for, for, for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, to start off, I'd love to just kind of talk about, you know, your background and, and possibly, you know, kind of growing up. What was your kind of childhood like and what kind of was the first time that you kind of found you yourself gravitating towards music? And do you remember the point where you're like, OK, I want to gravitate towards film music? Uh, I think I had a fairly modest uh, background as far as growing up. Mm -hmm. Just uh, two parents and uh, <laughs> dad was a cop who worked the night shift, so I didn't see him much, so oh, that was kind of unique. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I think my first kind of music memory is holding the Star Wars vinyl. Oh, wow. You know, with the big Darth Vader inside, I think it was inside. You open it and there he is. <laughs> and I don't know at that point if I really realized how much, like I had the album because I thought Star Wars was cool. And I don't know how much I realized how the music itself was cool, not just the fact that I was holding this thing with Darth Vader's face on it that right. my parents must have bought me. I don't remember. But, <laughs> uh, but that I remember that pretty clearly, cherishing that record and listening to it over and over. So that, you know, obviously the music did affect a lot of people. Um, and from then on, I, and I, I should mention that I grew up in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of surrounded by movies. Oh, really? and yeah. So every weekend, as soon as we were old enough, my friends and I would uh, go to the theater, the movie theater, drive down to, I remember I must have driven to Hollywood a thousand times in my youth to go to the big, uh, the, the Chinese theater, whatever, right. you know, the big theaters. The dome in the theater. Yeah. Yes, Cinerama Dome. Yeah. Oh, it's been there so many times. So m movies have always been a big part of my life. And a good friend of mine who was part of that group, he uh, kind of went into producing and writing. And uh, he, he was that, that was his thing when we were, he was always like kind of, oh, who's directing this? And he was into that side of it. Yeah, yeah. And I was always into the music side of it because I played clarinet. I don't know. <laughs> That's, so I was kind of into music uh, yeah. at that age. And I collected scores. We both collected scores, but I collected a lot of scores and listened to, you know, Williams, of course, Morricone and Zimmer. I was a big fan of all of his early right. synth stuff. Um, I saw you have a big, nice uh, Leone poster art there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was just, and he's my favorite director. So. Oh, he <laughs> is. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> if you'll notice, I take pride in the fact that all the posters in my studio are from other filmmakers that yeah. have inspired me over That's the years. True. It's not your stuff. No, yeah. I don't want my own posters in my in my <laughs> studio because I know I know all about those movies. I know it's probably not the right thing. Most composers probably have lined their walls with their own stuff, but I like you know, like Kubrick, I have a poster of his. Just yeah. all these things that I've that have inspired me mm -hmm. in growing up and the the, the Leone poster, I love that it says I think it says Clint Eastwood Sergio Leone, Ennio Morricone. Those are the only three names on the poster. Right. I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. That's where respect. Where Ennio gets the poster spot. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> on a poster with only three names. Right. Now it's like produced by eighty people, and yeah. but whatever. I want to get off tangent. Uh, back to your question. <laughs> so anyway, I went to. I'll make it short. I went to uh -oh. college, <laughs> for. Uh, initially for computer engineering. Right. <laughs> a little interruption. <laughs> that was the guy who mixes all of my scores. <laughs> He's very embarrassed now, but Jeff Biggers. Um, so, but yeah, I, 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 even through all my youth, I never thought, oh, I'm going to be a film composer. I never thought that, or music, anything. It was mm -hmm. just a hobby. Yeah. And I was good at math, so I, I went to UC Berkeley for uh, computer science was my degree. And I got about a year in, maybe two, I forget exactly. And I always tell this story, it's kind of boring, but I, I'll shorten it. Uh, I re remember the day where we had this programming assignment, and I 
I hated it. You know, I did it because I had to, but I really right. hated it. And I went to class that day that we had to turn it in or whatever. And I had some friends who were all so excited about this this assignment, and yeah. they were like, "Oh, how'd you do this? How'd you do this?" And I'm like, "Oh my god." I said to them, you guys should be doing this. I can't do this for a living. You know, I, right. I, That's when you knew that your heart wasn't in it. Yeah, yeah, it was. And I have those three guys to thank because they were like so excited. I'm like, <laughs> How are you so excited about this? I hate this. And this kind of relates back to what I said. My father being a uh, police working overnight. And he, he actually passed away when I was very young. Mm. So when, when I, he was already uh, passed away when I was in college. At this point when I thought oh I can't do this and I had already taken some music courses because it was already a hobby so I just to fulfill some credits I had already taken them and I thought maybe I'll switch to a music major I had a little keyboard at home you know I I continued the hobby mm -hmm. and and I still think to this day and my mom think and we all we all wonder if my father had been alive at that time would he have said mm -mm, you are not switching you're gonna stay. I don't care if you hate this computer science stuff. That seems like something my father would have said. Right. I know you can keep music as a hobby, but you're where, sticking where with where the this. careers are and where the money is. Right. Yeah. He could very well have said that, and he probably would have been right at that time. <laughs> you know, he, he couldn't argue with him. But my mother, to her credit, said, "Okay, if you want, if you really hate it that much, you can switch to a music major, and then we'll figure out. <coughs> excuse me, figure it out." So that's what I did, and I. Switched to a music major, and I think I had a minor in communications or something, and journalism. I don't, <laughs> but um, not to belittle that, but it was uh. it was very interesting. But I I just it was something to get out. Yeah. <laughs> and I I actually thought at that point maybe I'll do some recording engineering, mm. like Jeff who just interrupted, because um, <laughs> I had I was pretty well versed in some of the software, the computer software, and. So I thought when I get back to LA, I'll maybe do that. So I interned a few different places, um, did a few little jobs. Like there was one job a friend of mine worked at this karaoke place where you could, I don't know if they exist anymore. You could go in and say, I want to record myself singing whatever the latest song was at that time. Yeah. And they'd have a backing track and a recording studio and you could sing and they'd print it on a cassette at the time and yeah, give it yeah. to you. They have a, there's one in, um, God, was it Studio City? It's called like Dimples or something. I think it closed down. And it was, oh. a, it was one where you could go and do it online. You, you could oh. watch your friends, but yeah, I'm at the bar singing right now. Really? With a live webcam. Yeah. <laughs> this one was, I'm old, so yeah. this one was way before <laughs> webcams or anything. Right, right. You were just, it was in Westwood. You'd go in and sing and they'd give you a tape and they'd do a little mix for you. Yeah, yeah. And so I did a few backing background tracks. I did Part of Your World from The Little Mermaid. I did a couple of Little Mermaid just on my Yamaha keyboard. I programmed all the string parts. And wow. So that, that, that was like, it's kind of a good learning experience yeah, to yeah. orchestrate or deconstruct something, you know, Alan Menken has done. And, and I did that with Williams just for fun. And I remember in school, I would figure out the string arrangements for Raiders and try to program it. But so I did all these weird little jobs and then thought, I wonder if Hans Zimmer's studio is in the area and maybe they'd need some help or maybe I could be an engineer at their place, his place. And just from being a fan of his music, yes, you're, you're exactly. just looking him up because yeah. of that. I was really, at that point in my life, really obsessed with all of his scores, like Green Card and all these amazing, because they were so different. Yeah. So they, the electronic... And Black Rain. And oh my God. Yeah. It was so good. and. So I looked up this, and I had a book of recording in studios, recording studios. I found it, Media Ventures, it was called at the time. Called them up and <laughs> said, um, "Yeah, oh yeah." I said, "You need help or do anything? You need anything?" And they said, "Yeah, yeah, come on down." And it was a good time because now, at that time, I don't know if you've been to Zimmer. You must have been yes, to Zimmer. Yes, yeah. yes. When I first went there in 1996, it was. Maybe two small buildings. Yeah, on 14th Street. Thing. Yeah, on 14th Street. N now it's kind of the whole block. The whole block. Yeah, yeah. you got the whole block. Yeah, as he should. Bleeding fingers on the end and yeah. all the way down. To... It's crazy. I don't know 99% of the people that work there. But when I went, it was much smaller, and I think that worked to my advantage because I, you know, maybe it's still. I don't. I haven't been there a little bit, but 
it, I'm sure it's still great, but it was just there were so few people there. Right. So it was more hands-on learning and, and yeah, yeah. And I stayed there. I kind of, or I should say, I kind of never left. Like yeah. after my shift was just because I loved it so much. I wasn't. I think that was key for me. If any composers are out there watching, because I saw a lot of interns come in. Like, oh, I'm going to be a big film composer or something like that. Not literally saying that, but you yeah. could tell that was the, the idea. Yeah, that was the idea. I just loved what was going on there. And I'm like, hey, can I hang out and just watch? Yeah, and I think I annoyed watch. people, but <laughs> but they let me. And then that led to. That was around the time Harry Gregson Williams, you know, another fantastic composer, had just moved to LA from London to work there. Right. And he needed some help. And uh, this is kind of a funny little story. I don't think Jeff will, Jeff Sinelli will mind me telling you this, but. No, no, Jeff, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> he, so Harry, I started helping Harry, and uh, he eventually hired me, but. And this was. Um, during a time when Jeff was Jeff Zanelli was at school still in Berkeley mm -hmm. and somebody had already told him when you come back you can work for Harry <laughs> so and then I just happened to be around and I was working with Harry and he hired me and then <laughs> Jeff, I don't know how he found out but Jeff <laughs> But Jeff ended up working for John Powell. So yeah, he worked for John. It, it all worked fine. out. Yeah, it's like probably but like you took my job. <laughs> I think so, and I didn't know. I had no idea what any yeah. of this was going. I hadn't even met Jeff yet. <laughs> but later, when I found out, I felt terrible, and I thought, I wonder. I always thought Jeff like really hated me. I wouldn't blame him. <laughs> like, but, uh, but anyway, so I worked for Harry, and you got and you worked for him for a while. On a lot of yeah, on several lot of years. Films, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's great. He was always great to me, and taught me a lot. Um, I worked mostly on the technical stuff at first, mm -hmm. all this nonsense, although this is way more modern than <laughs> what I had to deal with. But, And I think it was just one night I, he was helping Hans on the fan, that Tony Scott movie. Yeah, yeah. And he left and I took a scene just for fun. I said, can I mess around? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, and I did some music for it. And the receptionist came in. She's like, oh, that's pretty good. What is that? And I think that may have been when Harry goes, oh, okay, you want to do that? Because I didn't, again, I didn't go, hey, let me write music. Yeah. It was just, I was just screwing, screwing around. Yeah. And so it started with, do you want to do this little 10 second cue? And then, oh, okay, that's not bad. You want to do this 30 second cue? <laughs> and you want to do five 10 minute cue? Or whatever. And, yeah. but it, to, that was Harry being generous. Yeah, you know, he needed the help, but he was also giving me great yeah, opportunity, great practice, and learning it. Yeah. And then Hans kind of like, oh, what's going on? And <laughs> Hans is, you, you know, Hans. He's, yeah. That's what's great about now. It's called remote control. That's if you're working there, you never. Hans might just walk in. Go, what are you doing? Because you know, he gets he's he's uh, gets he bored and lonely and bored. And yeah, lonely and bored and needs to go <laughs> talk to people. Around, yeah. and hassle everyone else. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, you know, shows him, show him what I'm doing. And, and I think the first thing he asked me to do was he did a concert in Ghent, I believe yeah, it was. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. And he needed, the, the score for Driving Miss Daisy was 100% electronic, nothing real in the original score. So there was never any handwritten uh, notation. Of it notation. Yeah. He said, can you do a suite of Driving Miss Daisy and so that we have, so that we can play it live, because it was never done, and I did that for him. And he thought it was great. He loved it. I remember he brought his wife in, and he's like, "You gotta listen to this." And she, I remember she's like, she couldn't care less. But, but man, for me, it, you know, I should emphasize. I mean, I'm sure the people watching understand how like intense That's of a situation that was to have Hans Zimmer ask me to do this. And yeah. By that point, I'd known him fairly well, but still. That was a yeah, big moment. I mean, that's <laughs> cloud to nine. To have him, yeah. Yeah. And it's his music, and I'm trying to do it correctly, and <laughs> yeah. it's just, I'm all I'm doing is listening to the track and trying to figure out all the notes. So I did that for him. He was happy, and and then he asked me to work on Hannibal, the, the, the Ridley Scott film. All right. And then Pearl, Pearl Harbor was a big one where I did a, quite a lot of work on that one. Yeah, that was a big film too. Yeah. And Michael Bay as well, yeah. 
<laughs> and that led to oh my god this is so long-winded i hope you no, viewers have shut it off no, by no, now. not at all um, <laughs> this, is what, this is what we're here for <laughs> oh good uh and during yeah pearl harbor i did a lot and there are two but, other hmm? but before before pearl harbor oh, yeah, i think the first time you worked with michael uh, was still with harry and you worked on armageddon a little bit yeah yeah well i was around during the rock but i didn't actually do much other than technical stuff the rock was actually the score that got me hooked into hans's music oh and what God. got me into films yeah. and stuff so that I, was like <laughs> i don't doubt it that score is still legendary uh, yeah uh but yeah i armageddon for sure i i don't think michael knew that i existed honestly even though I, I did write a few cues on that did you, did you meet him at all on armageddon or were you just kind of in the studio um, whenever i was in the studio i remember he, he had to walk through my office to get to harry's studio mm -hmm. you know i don't he probably didn't even look at me i don't <laughs> think and i do remember one day he picked up the yo-yo that was on my desk <laughs> and was just kind of doing this while listening to <laughs> harry's cue but no i don't michael was sort of all business yeah. at that time and just Armageddon was intense. Like yeah. that was I've never worked that many hours straight on any film, but uh so I didn't really meet him on that or Pearl Harbor, honestly. I Really? Wow. I because the meetings, you know, Hans yeah, because, is Yeah, you, know, you weren't lead composer, so he right. was dealing with Hans or He was dealing with Trevor Hans and Harry and stuff mm -hmm. like that, yeah. Uh so yeah, I would I would write in my room and then we'd all go listen in Hans's room. But yeah, the focus was always on Zimmer and you know, as it should be. That's uh but Pearl Harbor, because I did so much on that, there were two other people who worked on that. Bob Badamy, who's a legendary music editor, yeah, yeah. music supervisor as well, and Pat Sanston, who's a production supervisor, uh, for or was for Jerry Bruckheimer for years. I don't think he works with Jerry anymore. But those two guys, uh, and Zimmer and Harry, were all big advocates of mine. Mm -hmm. I have to thank them every interview I can, <laughs> uh, because at that same time, see all these things just kind of happened. That Michael Bay was forming his production company, Platinum Dunes. Right, because him and Jerry <clears throat> parted ways after Pearl Harbor. Right? Yeah, right. Jerry Bruckheimer right. and him kind of, yeah. Uh, and so yeah, he made his production company, Platinum Dune, <coughs> Dunes, which the, the the goal, or the the plan being to make all those horror films. Yeah. And the first one, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the remake, uh, was happening just after Pearl Harbor. And Bob Adamy, Pat Sanston, both told Michael, there's this guy who you may or may not know was writing on you know, all your stuff, and he wrote all these cues on Pearl Harbor, and you might have to give him a shot, you know, because they were looking for somebody to do this very low-budget yeah. uh, movie. That's where movies are usually yeah. low-budget, yeah. <laughs> and... So I th think they just hired me. Like, I didn't have to do anything. They just, wow. I, mean, I was terrified, of course. I still remember the big, I wrote it, that score, in Zimmer's room. He let me use his room for that. Uh, and I remember Michael coming in and sitting there listen to listen. And I'm like, oh, I was terrified. <laughs> um, but he liked what I did, and I did the whole thing. And obviously, he didn't get fired, fortunately. <laughs> And I remember to this day at the final playback, we listened to the whole movie, watched the whole movie, and he said, you know, great job, everyone, or whatever. He turned to me and said, wow, you did a great job, and we didn't pay you shit, or something <laughs> like that. He wouldn't pay you anything, because they really didn't pay me much. Yeah. But, you know, I was a young and new guy, and I was just happy to do it. Yeah, sure. So that was the beginning of i look at that moment of him going oh we, you did great and we didn't pay you as kind of the beginning of our relationship even though we i i had worked on many of his things already yeah he didn't really he wasn't aware of it right uh, but he was made aware of it but for because of bob people like bob and pat and zimmer and harry i'm sure talked as well uh and i think the, was the island it's all a blur maybe the island was right after Texas right Chainsaw one, Massacre. Yeah, I, so. <clears throat> I mean, that's a big step up. And yeah, I, that's from small horror to Bay action yeah. film. Yeah. And he asked me to do that, and I said okay, and <laughs> and yeah, again, he he liked what I did, and it's just 
You, the... you also worked on Bad Boys 2. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I skipped over that. Bad Boys 2, because that was a bit of a mess of a score where Mark had departed and Trevor right. was called in. So yeah. did you do more on that one than you did, like, say, on Armageddon? Was that more of, like, a yeah. patch kind of fixing things up? or? Yeah, we started from scratch, definitely. Oh, and that, yeah. that uh, Trevor was definitely the lead guy, but yeah, I did yeah. do a lot. And uh, because it was so time crunch yeah. they needed the two of right, us yeah. and it was just he and i would go to the meetings and with jerry and michael and again that was all very intense this is still super early in my career <laughs> yeah. i'm sitting there with but you uh around running hard yeah. oh <laughs> and no but i that's another good thing about zimmer's place is that it's like you don't there's no messing around mm -hmm. like it's very high level of stress and just intensity um, with these filmmakers. You know, these are the top filmmakers, yeah. and they don't—they don't mess around. They don't get up there in the, at the top for, for nothing. Mm -hmm. So I got to witness before I was thrown in to the deep end. I got to witness a lot of that stuff just sitting in the back of the room. Right. And that was a great learning experience. But um, so when you came to do the island, I'm sure now it's your you're the lead composer, and this is kind of your. <clears throat> It's a big action film. Was it intimidating? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, I I was still like terrified, and you always at the beginning of every project, you always think what? Like you get excited. There's a period of where I'm really you're really excited, like oh I get to do this, and yeah. then and then you realize I have to you're actually do it this. now. <laughs> like I, what do I do at this point now? That I. Um, so yeah, it was very scary. I, I Bay the first thing Bay showed me was that opening kind of dream sequence for the island and that's often how he and I work. He'll show me one scene that he has and say, Okay, hmm. just do something. <laughs> Not necessarily specifically for that scene, but right. just be inspired by this scene that is something that he finds important. Right. Uh, so I wrote a piece of music which is the piece that's in the opening. I remember him going, yeah, that's pretty cool, or whatever he says. Yeah, he never says, this is great. He just says, yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's not shit. No, it's, I think he said it was cool. It's kind of catchy, and and it just went from there. And I, I think I've had good luck with Michael as far as my initial ideas kind of being within, within the realm of what he's looking yeah, for. There's a reason why you guys have worked together for so long. I think. Yeah. Yeah, there's something clicking there where you guys have, uh, tapped into something and, and everyone loves seeing a director and a composer i think they really click and work on like yeah that together i know i do as a as a fan of movies yeah that's like that's the, that's really great and to be in that relationship <laughs> yeah oh, i know i feel very lucky but i keep thanking all these people but michael of course i have to throw in there because he of course, yeah. he's the one who said all right i'll give this guy a shot and <laughs> And he kept saying that, even with the first Transformers. Like I, I'm, I didn't assume he was gonna say, "Hey, you want to do it?" I yeah. thought, oh, I, he'll get Zimmer, or he'll, you know, still get somebody more, you know, whatever, bigger than me. Yeah. I mean, what is this? And then I think he said, I think he called me one day and just started talking to me as though he had already given me the job. You do. And I'm like, well, hold on. So do you want me to do Transformers? And he said, yeah, of course. What do you think? <laughs> and and I think he kind of did it jokingly, like, but uh, he's a very, he's a big jokester that way. Yeah, point. yeah. But, um, so I was like, oh, God, okay. Um, <laughs> and that was another, like, oh, boy. And, he, you know, he would throw out stuff like, yeah, we need good themes. You know, Spielberg's going to be part of this. And, or no, he said Steven is going to be, you know, listening to these themes, and he wants, you know, really majestic and I knew exactly who Steven was I didn't need I didn't need a last name Steven who? I was Soderbergh. like oh my god yes yeah, Steven Soderbergh. um so yeah it's just levels of levels just of growing and growing and growing yeah and it, it's all sort of a blur but uh, again that was a very long-winded uh, explanation of how we how got, got here today <laughs> I hope that answered your question so yeah so we kind of led up to um how you got to work with Michael and and, and uh, so since we're talking about Michael, but let's just talk about Transformers. We got to the first Transformers, right. and that film, um, I mean, that was 
I mean, I mean, I remember seeing it in the theaters. I remember it was like Fourth of July weekend, um, and I, remember, I used to work at an AMC theater in Maryland, and oh, nice. we watched it there. And uh, the music, I think, I think the reason why Transformers is so big today, I think, is honestly it's because of your score. I wow, personally thanks. think so. <laughs> um, so when you first started on that on that movie, you know, it's a Michael Bay action film, and the, the action is amazing. The ILM effects and everything what was kind of the, was it as simple as going okay we need big heroic action or how did you kind of find the sound of the autobots and the decepticons what was kind right. of the process for that wow that was, that's taking me back i think um it the thing about the first film that you can't you couldn't really get with any of these sequels is that it was all it was stuff we'd never seen before right and so i as a film fan and Transformer fan, I, I was so inspired just by all these things he was sending me, and even if they were rough images, and you know, this is all stuff I'd grown up with. And you know, my, I was actually a little too old for the Transformers, but my brother, mm -hmm. who's a bit younger than me, was way into it. So through him, I, I knew all about Transformers, and to see them come to life in this crazy way on screen, I still remember going, like. Is that real? It was like the shine coming off yeah. of the, the reflections. It was all so new. Now it's like, ah, uh, you know. Yeah. It still looks great, but we're all just so jaded now. Yeah, it's just you know, five like, comes in, yeah. Or CGI in general. It's CGI, just so yeah. everywhere. It's like hard to be impressed by it. But then it was really impressive. And I, and what Michael said about heroic and majestic and Spielberg, and it stuck with me. And I, I started just by writing a bunch of themes. You know, I wrote one for the Autobots, which ended up being their theme, and the All Spark. You know, this mythical mm -hmm. thing. I wrote that theme, and that's always been my favorite part, or one of my favorite parts. I have a lot of favorite parts, but one of my favorite parts is writing melodies because it's that's what got me into you know, yeah, this, this melodic scores. Yeah. yeah. Even though I've done some scores that are less melodic, but. Uh, that film because it was all so new and there were all so many revelations or revealing scenes of oh what's this coming and there was a lot more room for thematic material and I th I kind of just thought I, I really got to get this right so I was just writing tons of themes and mm. I think they all pretty much ended up in the movie and is that usually your process is kind of writing suites and mm -hmm. themes first and then kind of seeing what sticks yeah I Learn that from Harry and Hans. Yeah, they they do that too. Yeah, uh, and it just seemed like it made sense to me. It seemed natural to do it that way, because you you have to figure out your language first, and then you can kind of put it into the right. movie. If you yeah. don't know, you I can't like go score a scene. And I go, oh, what what do I do when that person comes in? Yeah. I don't I haven't figured that out yet. We have like a bank of themes already, kind of like okay, mm -hmm. this theme fits here. That's this character's theme. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the way I think it works best. That's why I like to get on films early enough where you can mm -hmm. do that. I've been on a couple where it's so last minute you just have to start scoring the scenes, otherwise you're never gonna yeah. you're gonna run out of time. <laughs> and that's it, you can do it, but it doesn't work as well for right. the narrative. But yeah, that's what I did for that one, and I don't remember any specific reason I went one way or the other other than just being inspired by like at one time I had for the Decepticon thing which we kind of went away from but the theme in there in the first movie is that choir piece and yeah it, the choir was so like cha da 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 oh, yeah what, it, what, are, are there actually is that Latin or lyrics or is it just kind of uh... I I took um, I took all of the, the Decepticon names that I could get my hands on uh -huh. and, and we uh, split them up by syllable, oh, wow. and then just kind of threw all the syllables up in the air and mishmashed mish -mash <laughs> them. So it's made up of Decepticon names, but it's just kind of wow. So that it's not like Mega Try. It would be kind of stupid. So <laughs> I thought, yeah, that would be dumb. That was like kind of the initial idea, but that would be just stupid. So Mega Try. <laughs> so we uh, just swapped uh, swapped syllables around mm. to the point where we thought, oh, this sounds pretty cool. It yeah. took a bit of work, but. So that's that's what that language is. That sounds and great. Occasionally there were a, a word, there were jokes, running jokes. Were, I forget the words, but <laughs> unintentionally there were like funny sounding words that in there, like pussy cat or something. Not that specifically, <laughs> yeah. but weird stuff like that. But 
I mean, it was. I mean, I just remember that scene of Sam on the roof and oh the yeah, yeah, and that's when the chorus really kind of comes in. That was cool. <laughs> yeah, no, that was fun. I really had fun doing uh, that stuff. That yeah, the whole Mission stuff. City battle. I think that's one of the, just. I mean, and it's the music works so close to the edit though, and that's right. one of Michael Bay's I think trademarks is that how I mean. When he edits the scenes, are you getting kind of already? A, I know he edits really to the last second, um, but when you get a finished, like that final battle, was mm-hmm. it already set for you to put the music on there? Does he use a temp track? I mean, how does he make sure the music really fits that close? I don't remember that if there was a temp track in that particular. His temp tracks, for better or worse, are usually not that structure. They're kind of just for pace or yeah. feel, uh, which is better for me. I don't want him like getting really specific with the temp and going here I want exactly this yeah uh, which does happen sadly yeah but he edits with I don't think he would be able to edit without music I think yeah. a lot of editors are yeah, like I that know, especially that, that kind of action I feel like it's so musically driven right. yeah um but yeah I don't remember that specific scene but uh I do think the first film was kind of more put together than maybe some of these more recent ones where yeah. like the last night it was great to work on we had a blast but there were a lot of picture changes right up right up till the end and just kind of frantically in the last few days figuring out how do we like ju- I will get a new picture my music editor and I go oh my god this it's all landing in the wrong place right. what like they took this shot of Izzy one of the characters and put it here and so as a composer, I mean, I just talked to Brian Tyler about this yeah. two days ago, and and he worked on the Mummy, and he gave an example where that movie changed last second. He wrote, he rewrote the entire main character's theme in two days, and then on the plane to Abbey Road, they was figuring out how they, he was appearing in seventeen places throughout the score, and they were able to fit it back in. But oh, yikes! So when you when when something changes like that, uh, that was but. How do you keep? Because I feel like a score is such a delicate thing. Where if you change something here, right. this could fall apart. Yeah. So, when as what kind of? Well, I guess how do you f- make sure your score doesn't implode? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> way to put it. It all depends on how much time you've got. Yeah. Like I, I, there were a couple spots where I just had to start over. I said, look, just throw it out. Hmm. We'll use the same idea, but I need to. We can't keep cutting it. Because we have else, to just. Yeah. yeah, we have to start over. But towards the end, there were spots where you have to say to yourself, okay, we can make this work, but this isn't going to work. Or we can make this work, but this isn't going to work. We have to compromise, Mm. which sucks. But there was literally no time. There was no time to re-record anything for sure. Yeah. And I'm kind of not a fan of doing, like, sample stuff Mm. and doing electronic stuff, patches, electronic patches, I guess I could say, like, Okay, I can fix this part, but it's going to be electronic, and then it's going to go back into the live orchestra, and it it just doesn't sound good to yeah. me. Yeah. So, and a lot of these scenes are so chaotic and noisy anyway. I'm like, uh, there's literally no one's going to notice. <laughs> but, I mean, you guys might notice, but yeah. I should take that back. <laughs> oh, but, yeah, your score lives on the soundtrack on a you know, so people hear it. That's, <laughs> that's why... One of the reasons why I released such a long, obnoxious, obnoxiously long soundtrack for this new Transformers because we had yeah, so deaths. much music. Yeah, it's amazing. And I said, I just want to release everything the way it. Sh- I wrote it, not the way it's in the film because mm-hmm. I, I. It's hard for me to watch the film when I just I, I hear every edit and I know and I think it's fine, but you know the audience isn't going. Oh, that was a bad music edit. But yeah, yeah. I am. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's frustrating. I'm not. I, I've never had to rewrite a character's theme and two days before scoring figure out how to. That's good for Brian. I got to call him about that one. But um, but yeah, no, he's he's right. That the the last minute changes. The fact that they can upload these movies to theaters overnight. Uh, yeah. It's frightening, and it, it allows them to to you know really well, remember, take it last minute. I remember watching one of the bonus features. I think it was the second one where every premiere had a different cut and what and i do want to talk about the yeah. second one because the second one was the writer strike one mm-hmm. and that must have been hell for everybody because the writers are the backbone of everything right, so right. when you don't have writers and you're working with the directors and editors who are good in their craft but maybe not story structure i mean was it um, was it hard for you as a i mean how did that yeah. whole movie kind of 
come together? Was it harder than maybe the fifth one, or how? They're hard in different ways. Yeah. I think they, if I remember correctly, they started shooting before they had a finished script. Yeah, you know, which is, which is <laughs> not the way you should do it. But, uh, and yeah, just figuring out, not seeing the end of the third act until way at the end is very is definitely very difficult yeah. because the a good film score follows the story and helps the audience along for the ride and follows the emotional arcs and the character arcs and all these things and you try your best to do it right well and shape it well and if it's if the story is constantly changing or yeah. shifting and things are moving it's it's, and I, and it's I try, not and easy. I, I think I feel like you guys get a lot of the composers in general get a lot of shit from fans. Oh, this this score isn't. But it's like I feel like if if the narrative is not there, you, you're you're working with what you have yeah. sometimes, and sometimes you can only do so much. I think, and right. uh, in certain situations, and um, but yeah, I think that's the reason sometimes because you're shaping your music. It's written to picture. Right. People, I think, forget that sometimes it's written for the picture. It is. Yeah. yeah. My. my... I never go into a movie thinking this is going to be my show. You know, yeah. I always think I have to help tell the story because that's my job. Exactly. I'm not here to sell albums. Uh, but yeah, it is difficult. It, one particularly difficult thing of and, and Bay at the, up until the last minute was really trying to shorten uh, the, the last night, mm -hmm. the fifth one. And so every cut we would get the scenes would all kind of be like this. A little bit shrunk, yeah. And uh, so, and there's so many scenes like that, it's, I can't redo them all, and so, so there are several scenes that used to have a nice melodic flow through the scene, but now it's like five notes from the theme, and then it cuts to the next part, and then it cuts to the next part, so I'm like, oh, it just it pains me to listen to this, because yeah. it's not. It was so much better before. I know it was so much better yeah, before, yeah. but I understand he needs to shorten his film. Yeah. So, and to him, it he doesn't hear it that way. He doesn't. It doesn't matter. It work, as long as it works for him, you know. Right. That's, you know, and I try my best to address all of these things as they come to us. But a lot, a lot of times, we won't even know it. Like the editors will have shortened the scene and shortened yeah. the music. And you don't see it till like you see the film. Yeah. If we're in, we're in the, or or like I'll go to the final the, the mix stage yeah. the final mix stage and I'll they'll play me back a reel and I'll go oh my god I did not know you'd done that to that scene yeah what we have to address it like right there are so many things going on on a Michael Bay film that I can't fault them for not going hey Steve we changed this scene yeah, yeah. they're dealing with eight million things on their own yeah as are we so I it, it's like we can't go through we get two or three cuts a day sometimes so we can't go through the whole movie and go okay what's changed Right. today okay let's change again <laughs> today we, we there's no time so yeah. it's it's like these movies are so complicated it's they're, i mean they're just, everything about them is complicated and uh in terms of action writing they're they're big bold and the sound design i think it's one of the, yeah. the most amazing things about the film but yeah for score is there do you write differently for these kind of films where you because you know you're going to be competing with Sound right. effects. I mean, the, one of the most iconic sound effects now. Are the, I mean, the, the, what, the Transformers sounds are kind of yeah. iconic now. But oh, I mean, yeah. So when your score is kind of mixed into this giant action mm -hmm. scene, was just metal crunching and explosions. Right. Does that affect the way your score sounds, or do you know, like, or do you have to go fight for your score in the mix to make sure it's heard? Or right. I mean, how is that going to work? I, I usually because I I'm not often working with the final sound effects. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what they're going to be. Right. I, towards the end, I start to hear them. They start to show up in my, in my audio files that I get with the picture. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, but yeah, that's always in the back of my mind. The thing, the good thing is, on I've, having done all five movies, uh, the same two, well, it's a team, but the same two lead guys, Ethan uh, and Eric, mm -hmm. these two amazing geniuses with sound, have done them all as well. And we've all done all five movies, so I know them very well. Right. And they get my music, and they will go so far as to pitch their sound effects to be in the same key if it's clashing. Wow. If, That's uh, amazing. Uh, these guys are great. And there was a scene in, I think, the third film 
where it's a really emotional scene, a slow piece of music. And I think it's when the Autobots are being sent away and a helicopter flies over in slow motion and the blades, you know, Michael wanted the blades because yeah. it's a cool sound. <laughs> yeah. And I remember one, we I went to the stage and listened to the scene and I said, oh my God, that's, the, the blades are actually in time in the exact tempo of my music. That's crazy. And I looked at Eric and he kind of gave me this look like he timed the blades to be in time with my music so that you know subliminally it's not clashing it's not right. like it feels a bit more natural and you know I don't know if anyone in the audience would notice that but all of these little things that they do uh, to help things not clash I think really help and that, that's key it's key for composers on movies like this I guess any movie but action movies specifically to yeah. get to know your sound designers and befriend them and try to work. I had the same thing with the uh, Wiley statement on Deepwater Horizon, mm -hmm. another very sound effects heavy yeah. film. We worked together a lot. It's just a good relationship because it's he's the, these sound guys are doing the same thing I'm doing. They're trying to tell the story but just with different tools and Right. Uh, so it all the soundtrack is dialogue, music and effects and it all has to work together. Yes. <laughs> so we all have to work together. So I we try as much as we can. Uh, but yeah, there is a certain amount of towards the end. There are there's all, there are always going to be scenes where like oh, there's just too much going right. on. Yeah. Because they need to do their thing and I need to do my thing. So maybe I'll, that's why I go to the dub stage a lot. And dub stage, I don't know if people know. That's where we sit in a big movie theater and mix every little sound, every bit of dialogue, every bit of sound effect, every music cue. We mix it all together in a big theater and make it sound as good as we can. Um, and I'll go there and go, oh, maybe this scene is just way too noisy. Everybody agrees. Maybe if we take out those drums or, you know, whatever, maybe lower. That's what we have the music split out right. in many tracks. Stems, yeah. If we just remove this and that's uh, that's why I go there to try to help and they go, oh, yeah, that's that's not clashing with this anymore. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's a process. You don't really get to fine tune until that stage yeah. at the end. It's it's impossible to do that throughout you just right. I just have to do what I think is right for the scene and then the fine-tuning will happen mm -hmm. later <laughs> wait uh, before we get off Michael Bay there is one of, of base films that I really really liked and I think a lot of people either didn't get it, it was pain and gain I thought it was such a good movie overall yeah. and I thought your score was just perfect Thanks. for it <laughs> and I think one of the challenges with that is it was a movie that was I think heart uh, very challenging with tone mm -hmm. and, because it comes across as these bumbling idiots doing this right. stupid crime and you, you're trying to figure out do you sympathize with them do you, you are you supposed to be disgusted by them right but your score found this perfect tone was it that a challenge Thanks. to find like was it a process to find what the what the music should be right. for that film it michael explained the film to me so well that it, it actually wasn't that much of a process oh, okay. because oh, he yeah. he said i mean it's always a challenge to find music that's good and works right but he said to me, like that whole Mark Wahlberg theme, the opening thing and the, the main theme of the yeah. movie, he said the idea is that like he's he's in his own fantasy world of of you know of um it's kinda hard to explain because he was such a messed up guy in yeah. real life, but yeah. Mark uh, Bay wanted to with the music wanted to convey this kind of fantasy world in his own head of like his voiceover kind of explains it all at the beginning yeah, and the end. Yeah, getting oh, get hit by a car or something. Yeah, he wanted this beautiful kind of ethereal, sort of uh, perfect world kind of thing that he this guy was never going to attain. But that that's what he wanted, and he just had this really terrible ways of going about getting it. Right. Um, so I immediately understood what he meant, and he showed me that opening, and it's just this beautiful kind of slow motion and you know Michael Bay visuals you can't yeah. get any better than that so I just again I just wrote this piece and I remember he said oh I played it to him in this room I think and he said oh that's catchy he liked that little that little guitar yeah piano thing um, and that was actually a slightly different process because it 
I, I then, actually not that different, I wrote a bunch of pieces of music, but it, it was scored almost like a Scorsese movie where it's just sort of different vibes, yeah. almost, almost song-like, but not, there were a few songs, but, so I just got to write a bunch of totally different style, all electronic, but different tempos and different sounds, and there were a few scenes I scored, like the dramatic stuff. Yeah. But, uh. But, but it, I just remember as an audience member feeling, and, and it just, I, for some reason I walked away from it going, wow, that was really good, because like, you were creating this kind of perfect world inside, but what, all the stuff we're seeing was just so messed up. Right. So you, it made me feel very uncomfortable. Oh, good, yeah. Which was, I think, the effect. Right. I, yeah. That was yeah, some a, of the dark stuff, we just did a lot of weird noises. And yeah. That was, that was a lot of fun. And for, uh, for Dwayne Johnson's character, we bought Doyle, mm -hmm. I think his name was Doyle. I know. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. I think... Like he's this innocent, really. He's this big, massive guy, but he's so innocent, and right. you know, he he knows this is not right, and so this theme. His theme is actually something I wrote as possibly for the, for something else, and he's like, oh, that would work for, uh, for Doyle. I don't even think he said that. I think he just put it on Doyle in a scene and showed it to me. I'm like, oh, that works great. It's wow. like it plays his <laughs> kind of innocence and. And the, Bay does that a lot. I, I like that. I write. I love when director. If I write something for this character, for example, and they then they right. take it and put it on that character, and it works ten times better. I'm all for that. But but no, that was that was a great fun. I really enjoyed that film too. Yeah, I thought he I did a great that. job. I I don't you know you never know what people are going to respond to in right. the world. And but how do you respond to that? Like I, I, in terms of negative criticism and stuff like that, do you look at it and go? As uh, it's just people's opinions, or do you look at it and maybe go, oh, maybe they have a point, or do you try to, do you read it all, or do you block yourself from it? Um, I think I used to read more, I'm not sure, I don't, you get so busy, you don't pay attention to that right. stuff, but I do think he's, you know, he's an unfair target, he gets, yeah, he's an easy target too, he's a very easy target, yeah. and, um, um, but something like, because something like Transformers the last night, no, there's no critic on earth who's going to like that <laughs> you know and i but we know that so and he he's making it for this very specific audience who are all these kids who send me thousands of messages on facebook or twitter or whatever yeah. and they say oh, i loved it and the scene and the when you brought the theme back here and they they're over the moon for this stuff and right. that's who it's for it's not for anyone else really yeah um but yeah, when he does something like Pain and Gain, you go, oh, you know, I, I don't know why people didn't respond to that or why, you know, I think, I don't know what he would have to do to get a critical, uh, <laughs> po positive critical response. He did, I don't, 13 hours did okay, but you didn't do 13 hours. No, so I was doing, that? Is I was just a schedule thing? Uh, well, I was doing Deepwater Horizon uh, and uh, he, I think, I believe he wanted Zimmer to mm -hmm. do it and then... It kind of was Zimmer Lauren right. combo. Who you know, you can't go wrong with either of those guys. Yeah. So, and uh, um, so yeah, they ended up doing it. Yeah. I'm not sure how much Zimmer actually ended up doing on it, but he was involved a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, I never saw that. But I've heard it's pretty good. That's I don't know the yeah. critical uh, response to it, but <laughs> but yeah, I think I think it's just not right. <laughs> it's not it's not fair. Uh, um, one of, another director that you work with and you mentioned Deep Water Horizon was Peter Berg yeah. and um, he comes from acting as well mm -hmm. and writing and and is working with some a director like that who's um, a completely different experience than working with someone who's with Michael I mean what, what kind of director is Peter in, in the films that you've worked with him in right. like Battleship and yeah. Lone Survivor mm -hmm. and Deep Water he's um, he's great first of all they're both great guys they're yeah. very different personalities right but they're similar in certain ways. I mean, when they walk into a room, you kind of know the director has walked in. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but for different reasons. I think uh, Pete, you can tell he's an actor. Like, he'll... Um, because he'll kind of get more more of his director hat on, like he's talking to an actor when he's talking to me, for instance. Like, mm. he'll come up to me. He's got to feel like... You know, he'll give me kind of that and, like, <laughs> try to pump you up, which is cool. I like... I, I love working with so uh, any uh, like I've had I feel lucky I've worked with a lot of different directors. I'm yeah. lucky that I've worked with consistent directors, but I like working with new people because yeah. these to be a director I think you have to be a little nuts <laughs> to to oversee such a crazy 
thing, like a movie that it's has a $50 million. million. Yeah. <laughs> so I love seeing the, how these guys operate. And, and yeah, Pete's very, he's kind of just a big personality who's like uh, very emotional and, you know, he'll show you if he's mad or if he's loved something. And, you know, Bay's a bit more, you know, he'll show you if he doesn't like something, but if he, if he really likes something, he'll say, that's cool. You know, he's, he's a bit more controlled. Right. Um, but Pete, I think it'll, Pete will you know, jump on the couch or start doing push-ups <laughs> or something. If he's, he uh, seems like that guy. <laughs> yeah. No, but he's great. He's really funny to, to work with. And he's, um, but musically, I think they're both kind of similar. Not that they like the exact same things, mm-hmm. but they both like, they both like melody they both like simple. They both yeah. like, uh, you know. And I, the thing is, I, I, I like that too. So right. I know that if I write something, if I'm not feeling it myself, I know 100% if I play it to either of those guys, they're not going to like it either. So right. I've learned that over the years to just work something until <laughs> I think it's good uh, and then play it to them. And generally, you know, you know, it's not like I everything's a hit, you know, things get right. thrown out, but generally that's a good, uh, that's a good method with both of them. Yeah. But and the yeah, and this, I love the scores you've done with, I mean, Battleship and, and, uh, Deep, I, thought, I love Deepwater too. I thought Deepwater was such a great score and Thanks. it works so well. That um, was fun. Lone Survivor was interesting because you, it was a mesh, mashup with Explosions right. in the Sky. So how did the, what was the idea behind that? Did you kind of come in to score it and then did Pete, because I know he used it on, used them on Friday Night Lights. Mm-hmm. So was that kind of his idea to like, oh, maybe that'll work? Or was that a kind of a, a Pete Berg idea? The, Pete's idea initially was to have me and the band work together on the score. Mm. And I said, great, you know, I love those guys. They got yeah. a really great sound. And I got a call one day from Pete saying, look, they called, the band called me and I didn't take offense to this, and I'm not, this is not negative towards yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. I understand where they're coming from. They, Pete called, I mean, they, the band called Pete and asked him, he said, look, can we, we just want to do this on our own. Can we, can we do that? And he said, okay. Because, you know, so he called me and said that to me. He said, mm-hmm. look, he was up front. He said, the band called, they said they really want to give it a shot on their own. And, uh, and I said, okay, you know, you're the director. I'm, yeah thanks for calling in the first place but uh that's fine and and then they they scored the film and later i don't know how many a couple months in i got a call that (laughs) pete's like can you come in and come back do some yeah i i don't still not i'm not sure what i'd heard because the music editor is a good friend of mine and Mm -hmm. i'd heard there were some issues, and I, I don't know right. what they were. Yeah. You know, there's issues with every movie. Every movie so yeah, that happens all the time. So he's like, you might get a call, I don't know, and I got a call, Pete wanted me to basically do the third act, which is what I did. Right. You know, I did a few things uh, throughout mm-hmm. the, the film, but... Uh, so did you know what they were keeping already? And you were like, all right, this is what we're keeping, and this is what you have to fill in the gaps? Pretty much. There were a few things where he asked me to redo it, but he actually ended up going back to the... Mm. He preferred the explosions thing, mm. which, again, it's part of the job. I don't take any events. Yeah, yeah. But, he, uh, but it was probably was a challenge for you to try to make it mesh, right? right? Yeah, to make that your was, sound fit with what was already there, right. which is... That was a challenge for sure. I didn't, I, I didn't want the third act to sound like, oh, my God, who stepped in and did yeah. this? So I, I played... Uh, I got out my guitar and kind of dialed up my reverbs and tried to try to at least stay in the in the vibe right. of explosions you know they've got a very cool sound so yeah. so uh i tried my best and but yeah basically i did a, three or four scenes throughout that he wanted me to do and then the third act through the end and uh so yeah it's it, it's it's a co-score but not 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 yeah. the way originally intended right not like <laughs> they just wanted to do that and they're they're in austin i think yeah and it would have been I'm not sure how that would have even worked anyway. We yeah. probably would have done it similarly. Exactly. Like where right. I'm doing it here and they're doing it there and then trying to see how to push yeah. it all together. <laughs> but uh, no, I thought that I, I enjoyed that. That was uh, the thing about that film and Deep Water is that those are both obviously true stories. Right. So you go I go into a film like that 
always in the back of my mind I think uh, like the wives or the parents or relatives of these still people who passed away are still alive and probably going to watch this movie right and I, the last thing I want to do is make it uh, you know Hollywood or anything uh, like yeah. a cheesy or so I all oh, that's why those scores are a little more subdued yeah a little bit more reserved and yeah. closer here and the melodies are yeah. toned down a little bit. Really, yeah, yeah. I was terrified of doing anything that would offend right. you know these people. Yeah, that, that's a lot of Just weight to have on your shoulders, though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I got to meet some of the people involved, and it was you know that right. was pretty gratifying that they liked the film. Yeah. So you you're doing you, the thing is you've done so many different genres. I mean, you've done horror and you've done comedy and you've done um, action. But I feel like Transformers did kind of make you the action guy. Um, mm -hmm. And I've talked to a composer about this. How do you kind of escape that kind of Hollywood typecasting where it's like, oh, yeah, you did Transformers. You're oh. the action guy. Like, do you have to work hard to kind of try to find these other projects that, you know, that you know that you can do, whether it's something a little bit out, out there like Keanu? Like, you wouldn't right. expect Steve Jablonski to do Keanu, but right. it's like, that's a great, awesome thing. Yeah. You know? um, I, my agents are well aware that I'd like to do, uh, you know, different things. Right. But it is very hard, and I think this goes for anybody in mm -hmm. any field in the movies. Yeah, it's just directing, acting, yeah. You get put on a list of when movies come up of this style, and they go, okay, what about those guys? They do this pretty well. Yeah. And occasionally someone will show interest for something else, and they'll say, have you done anything like, uh, you know, whatever, a jazz? I'm like, <laughs> I have nothing like that. I don't know what to tell you. I, I'd be happy to do it, but, you know, right. so it's... It's hard in those situations because they they're you know they're going out on a limb by saying okay you've never done this before but we'll give you a shot right uh, they you know I don't blame producers directors for going gravitating towards people who they know can do the things that they want right but I I it's ran like, it's into, like for me like if I apply to a job and it says you need three to five ex years experience I'm like I right. don't have that but I know I can do it right yeah. right. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. I, I know I could. Like, I was watching a film the other day. I can't remember what it was, but it was just a very like the polar opposite of a Transformers film. Right. I'm like, I know, you know, I know I could do that and I could do it well, but will I ever get the chance? Probably not. Yeah. But but you know maybe something like Keanu. It was uh, the director loved. He tempted with. Uh, pain and Gain, which oh, yeah. some of my fans probably, if they saw it, they'd probably go, oh, this, why does it sound like Pain and Gain? <laughs> That's the reason. Uh, and he, and I had apparently met him, he, he was a fan, and he came to one of my Transformers sessions oh, wow. years ago, and uh -huh. I, I don't remember, but, but he's a great guy, so that's how that happened. But again, even that, that was, that had a lot of action yeah. music, and... It was one of those, I think, com comedy scores where it's typical to do an action score to make it seem funnier because the guys yeah. who are, they're, they're not action stars, but they're kind of caught in yeah. this kind of serious situation. <laughs> that was that old thing. You let the humor be on the screen, let the music play it serious. Yeah, which is like, you know, going back to Elmer Bernstein and Airplane. Yeah, and right. Stuff like oh, yeah. That. <laughs> no, that works. You don't want to, if the if the guys are funny on it, you know, Key and Peele, you, they were funny, yeah. so they didn't need help with the music. Uh, well, Your Highness was also a great score, I thought. Oh, that, that was, was a lot so of fun. fun. See, that's another one that I was like, this is such a great movie, but, you know, that's my taste. Yeah. You know, and I thought it was so funny, and it was, you know, just making fun of all those 80s kind of right. swords and sorcerer movies, and and <laughs> we we thought, you know, I don't know if there, how much of a plan there was, there was for sequels, but... Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of left it open at the end, and I was like, "Oh man, I hope we make five of these because it's so fun." Yeah. Just working, David Gordon Green, working with him is fantastic, and Danny McBride. And, yeah, it's great. Guys. I mean, yeah. I was laughing all, you know, every work day I was laughing, and but you know, it's another one. I go, okay, people love the music, that's great, but I wish they loved the movie too, and <laughs> yeah. so we could keep doing it. Right. <laughs> you know, can't have everything. But going and touching back on another horror uh, genre that you did was of course horror, which kind of really on you did all these horror remakes. Right. Um, so when you're doing these kind of modern tellings of Nightmare on Elm Street and uh, Friday the Thirteenth and Texas Chainsaw, um, do you do you look back at the originals and see kind of what was done there, and did you just try to modernize right. that, or do you try to give it kind of something new? What was the idea behind those scores? I, 
uh, well, fortunately, I didn't have to because I, I didn't have to look back because I'd seen all those yeah. a thousand times yeah, growing yeah. up. I really loved horror movies growing up. And that's why when I was asked to do Texas Chainsaw, I was like, oh my God, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, I, and I didn't, kind of on purpose, I didn't go back and look. Right. Just because I didn't want to be too influenced. I, I just knew, I remembered the feelings and the, the vibes I got from those movies. And yeah, and you have the ch-ch-ch. Oh, your head well that, <laughs> yeah. That's, and I did that myself. I'm going to do that myself if anybody, you know, has any objections, I don't care. So I was in my studio. I spent hours doing that, trying to figure out how to make it sound cool. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I probably didn't need to spend that long, but I was having so much fun. I just got like, Shh. You know, I'm putting a delay and yeah. processing, but but anyway, uh, so that yeah, that for sure we had to use. But everything else, I just tried to go off the feeling I had, and and the films were modern takes on them right. anyway. So yeah. I approached it with a more modern sense, and I don't know, I had I had fun on all of them. They were all films I knew from my youth, and it yeah. was cool to be working on new Absolutely. versions of them. Um, another one of my favorite. One of my personal favorite scores of yours is Steam Boy. I thought oh, right. Steam Boy is such a great movie, Thanks. great score, and um, I mean, what, how did you get involved in that? You know, doing a, a, a mm-hmm. Japanese anime film uh, with uh, Katsuhiro Otomo, right? And you know, for, for he's known for Akira. And, mm-hmm. um, what was it like working with that? With that, uh, bringing I guess your sound into that world and creating right. such a heroic, you know, old-fashioned her- heroic theme. Oh, that was stuff great. Like that. I yeah. wish I could do more films like that. Uh, I'll just briefly tell you this. It was Alan Meyerson, who's a big time recording engineer, yeah, mixing Alan's engineer. Amazing, yeah. yeah, he does Hansa stuff. He, um, the sound producer, I forget what his title was. The guy in charge of sound for Steam Boy mm-hmm. from Japan. Uh, this guy, Kay, really nice guy. He contacted Alan and said, We want. Otomo wants a really nice, big thematic Hollywood score for this movie, mm. and you're the Hollywood guy, a mixer. What, 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 what do you think? And he put this out to everyone at at Media Ventures. I think it was still called at yeah. the time Hans's place. Um, said he, if you guys want to put together demos, you know, all the younger guys mm. like me and Zanelli and. And I think we put together demos. I don't know if we actually wrote demos or if we just put things together and sent the CDs. Mm. But that's how I got that job. They picked me out of the bunch, and and uh, that was fantastic. I remember the cha- I remember they sent me the film, and I was always an anime fan. And, yeah, and is, that, is that is that your only animated film? Uh, have you uh, n- no, oh, that, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. that is the yeah. only one I've worked on others, but right, not right. For, with me as the yeah, composer. Yeah. No, I'd love to do another one, but but no, that was great to work on such classic looking. You know. I mean, yeah, I mean, and the, the themes are still, I think, some of your your best themes. And I did, they Thanks. feel like early um, Transformers themes too. I can oh, I nice. sense the, your style there a little bit. Kind oh, of that's <laughs> cool. Thanks, I appreciate. <laughs> kind that. of building in there. Um, yeah, that was pretty early. <laughs> you also did a kind of a crazy South Korean uh, film. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> D-war. Yeah. Um, which was, I, I guess, it was probably because you did Transformers and they wanted that sound. But it's, yeah. uh, it was that was a lot of fun, though. I mean, the the, the score was, but the movie right. is insane. What did you think when you saw that film? Well, I think <laughs> I always the director was such a nice guy. He's very famous in Korea. Yeah. And such a nice person to work with, and I think what may have gone wrong and is he he didn't speak english and if you think about it, someone who doesn't speak english directing a bunch of english speaking actors. actors yeah there was a lot of american actors in there there was a lot of i i wasn't on the set but i that, i just got that vibe that they were probably all confused <laughs> half the time like what does he want us to do <laughs> so it it didn't maybe work as well as it could have but uh but the people made it so and i'm bummed out i wasn't able to go to korea for the premiere to meet with them or anything but yeah i really wanted to go because they were so nice but uh, i had fun again i had uh, hans taught me something early on when we worked on a film i won't say what it is just i don't want to offend anyone but he said look the film 
the film isn't that good. So let's just have fun. Let's just have fun writing good music, okay? And uh, it was it was his film, but you know he asked me to help. Right. And I was working uh, during the day. I mean, sorry, dur he was working in his studio during the day. I would come in at night, work all night, mm -hmm. and he would hand it off to him as he came in the morning and do that. Uh, and it got to the point where I'd I'd write something overnight, and he'd come in, I'd play it to him, and I remember one day he went, "Oh, okay, so." This is how it's going to be. All right. So I actually have to write some good music. Like he, <laughs> he was compliment. He's saying, OK, this is actually really good. Let me. All right. I'll write something good today. And so it became kind of a fun game, I guess. Almost I like a competition. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was fun. And I always that's a good another good lesson he taught me. It was just right. it. So few films get made that are really good. <laughs> yeah. And uh if you're working on a bad film and you know it and everyone knows it, you just still have to power through it and write as good a score as you can yeah, and, do your best job. Yeah. and hope the themes at least help, you know, a little bit and help, uh, not that, I don't know if this broadcast in Korea, I don't want to say <laughs> D-War is bad, I think, but it's one of those campy kind of things. Yeah, I think for sure. we all knew it. So yeah, yeah. it's nothing. I mean, you can tell from the, the trailer itself. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we knew it, and I was but just that, writing. That, themes that and... arrangement of Ari Rong at the oh, end. Oh yeah. Oh my God, it was beautiful oh, because thanks. it's a traditional Korean mm -hmm. uh, piece, and you kind of added your sound to it. And I yeah. thought it was such an amazing way to end oh, the whole thanks. thing. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> um, so kind of looking at your uh, process in general, not any specific film, um, and I kind of you already talked about writing suites at the very beginning, but I was like to ask composers, where does the first note come from? That that that. Hmm first thing that right. the first thing i mean are you looking at the script are you looking at the first cut of the film i know you know it's probably mm -hmm. different for any every right. movie but kind of what's the first thing that you gravitate towards is it the characters the mm -hmm. cinematography i mean is there anything uh you're right that it is different for every film i yeah. i've learned that uh the script is generally not for me anyway is not a great like source of inspiration I mean, yeah. it is i should say that i could write a script i, so I could write a score based on a script uh -huh. but the problem is if 10 people read a script they're all going to see a different movie in their head mm -hmm. so inevitably if i read a script it's not going to be what the director makes right and like i read the island script before i saw any of it and i had this other all kinds of ideas and the second he showed me that opening sequence all of those ideas went out the window wow, yeah. and I instantly had this other idea mm -hmm. that I went with and that's what the score ended up being so it, that movie specifically taught me kind of like maybe just wait for some images or it images I think are for me personally that, yeah. that's what's kind of the most inspiring thing even if it's just one scene because music is movies are so much about pacing and and the arc of the story and trying to match what the actors are doing right. and like I can imagine it all day long or read it on a script but it's not going to be what I always tell people audiences don't read the script they don't care what's in the script they yeah, care what's up on there the screen yeah and half the time what's on the script doesn't even end up in there anyway <laughs> it's or it's different or it gets changed on the set so I I take any any information a director wants to, if there is nothing to look at i'll tell the director look just tell me anything you have in your head yeah anything you got i'll take it and uh there's usually something they say like bay with pain and gain like the way he described his this perfect world and his right little things like that they send me off and and you know i might not get it right the first time but it, that is at least a starting point to yeah. help me so so yeah, it does vary widely with every film, but it's it's usually something the director has said, right. or someone has said, or something they've shown me, or a combination of the two. Which is, but yeah, because that first note is the tricky one, and trying to figure out how the sound, and also I think a lot of directors that hire me like they tell me that oh yeah, I really like the sound you use, mm. and and there are I try my best to create custom sounds for yeah. every film so that they all have sound a little different right 
So you have your, your voice as a composer too, as an auteur, I think. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I guess thematically, yeah. But like what to play these themes on or mm, you know, yeah. what instruments to use or uh, things like that. Just like I'm, I'm, I'm starting a new film in a few months. I don't think I'm supposed to say what it is, but uh, I'm already thinking sounds and yeah. like what. Will you try to go to the set or look at set mm -hmm. photos and stuff like that? Yeah, I think I will. I'm going to go to the set uh, maybe next month. Oh, cool. They haven't started shooting yet. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, to get to get a vibe. But yeah, just it's it's always an uh, interesting process to sure. come up with something to fit a, a movie, you <laughs> yeah. know, like the sounds and melodies and but it's yeah, look, it's it it's it's a great job. I I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another realm that you, you kind of got into uh, was video games, which oh, yeah. a lot of people really love your, your game scores um, for Gears of War and and right. um, and when and you did I think a Prince of Persia game. Mm -hmm. And so when you started getting into that world, did video games kind of get open up something that you were like, wow, this is something creatively rewarding that I didn't have in film or television? Is uh, that yeah, it's it's a different process in that because you're not scoring to a fixed picture you're right. scoring to gameplay and well you yeah. can do cutscenes but like you know yeah the cutscenes the cinematics they call them yeah. are the most like what I'm used to doing right because they are scenes yeah <laughs> but they are scenes that won't change but you're right the gameplay you never know what's going to happen what the player's going to do right so it's different in that uh, it's it's a bit more structured like you there are usually great big spreadsheets that say we need 90 seconds of you know uh, whatever mysterious action music or they'll they'll group it by levels like this we need a sound for this level a sound for this level or mm -hmm. something and then within each level we need 90 seconds of of mid-tempo action music mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of those and they all have to loop back right. to the front yeah. seamlessly <laughs> so, so that play if the players staying in one area for yeah a yeah if, they, if area. the player is really terrible and they can't <laughs> pass the level for 10 minutes it has to be able to play and and uh so that side of it's different and it's fun you know just to write 90 or two minutes of action music without having to hit cuts it's fun it's right. a different experience and but do you as a composer uh know how it's gonna you don't know how it's gonna end up being used right because they, the, the developers right. kind of take your music and score it themselves in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Where you, you kind of deliver the tools and they like, yep, this is what we asked him for and yeah. we're going to put it oh, in. Yeah. I've talked to Cliff Martinez and mm. he never did a, a, a game before. He did Far Cry 4 and he's right. like, yeah, I don't know how it is. How yeah. how it is. I've never seen how it's <laughs> I've played. played Far Cry 4. It's great. Yeah. He did a great job. It's a great score. Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. You don't know what they're going to do with it. Right. Um, and I think even now, I haven't done a game for a few years, but I think now that you, the technology is advanced to a point where they can I remember them telling me about this like they were working on th things where depending on what players do they can actually start triggering like turn the drums on or turn them off yeah, or like triggering a... really specific things within the music which wasn't right. a thing when I was doing Gears of War or it's kind of scoring on the fly yeah, yeah yeah basically and like I don't know how they come up <laughs> with that stuff but so but that probably doesn't change the composers. Or maybe it does. It might make it more complicated. I'm not sure. But it's, it's, uh, regardless, you give them stems, as you yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. You know, things right. split out, and they can mix it in however they want. But yeah, Gears was great to work on. It's such a big story, and, yeah. and guns, and <laughs> the cutscenes were really dramatic and fun. And yeah, they're great scores, too. And Ramin took over. He took the last yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, the, the, I think different people made that game yeah it, it moved to a different company i forget who but i haven't heard it but i'm sure Ramin did yeah, great it's fantastic uh one thing that i forgot to ask you about a little bit earlier in your career was desperate housewives which oh, i right. thought was such a fun thing and, and something that people don't really associate it with but i mean you were behind the score for one of the most popular you know tv series right. you know of all time and what was it like creating that world it's such a unique world and creating for an ensemble cast like that right. over the course of what was it eight seasons or yeah. something like that it was that was fun i'll tell you just briefly how that like how did i stumble into that, that <laughs> i did a show called 
a TV show called Threat Matrix, which nobody will remember. It was an ABC <laughs> thing that was pretty cool, but it just didn't catch on. And it was an action show, as you could tell from the title, yeah. and uh, ABC, same network. And one of those, one of the producers on that, we became friends. He went on to pro to produce Desperate Housewives, mm. not Mark Cherry. Uh, this was, there were three main producers at the beginning of Desperate Housewives. Mark Cherry was the creator, and then my friend uh, was one of the producers as well. Um, and he called. They Mark wanted Snuffy Walden, right? Because he's you know. The guy. The, the guy, him and Mike Post, you yeah. know, that, those are the two TV guys, the, right. the legends. Um, and so they got Snuffy Walden, and I guess they were having issues like you have, and I don't. There became there came a point where they said, I think we need to change composers. I don't know. They started reaching out. All these all these different producers started reaching out to people they knew. Right. And Michael Edelstein is his name. Edelstein. He reached out to me and said, hey, what are you doing? And I was doing Steam Boy at the time. He says, I've got this pilot and we, we need someone to do the music. And I I said, I'm too busy. I just, <laughs> he said, just look at it. So he sent me the pilot, which is amazing. The right. pilot, the pilot of Desperate Housewives is so good. <laughs> and I said, oh God, this is good. Okay, Tom tonight at 10 o'clock PM, I'm gonna stop working on Steam Boy and I'm gonna write, because he wanted me to write a demo. Yeah. So I'm going to write a demo uh, for this, and that's the best I can do. And it was, the demo that I wrote is the first cue you hear in the, the episode that I did. The first episode I did is actually the second or third episode. It's, yeah. I, it's a long story, but... Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it was, I didn't hear back for months, because they were still making the show, right. a, couple, a month <laughs> or two at least. And then I got a call out of the blue that Mark Cherry had, I think he'd reject, he didn't know who I was. He said, ah, I don't know if I want that guy. And some editors had taken my demo and thrown it into a scene and Mark's like, what is that? And he's like, oh, this is this guy, he wrote your demo a month ago. And <laughs> so I got a call saying, okay, we want you to score the first, no, what was it? Oh, Steve Bartek had scored the pilot. And that didn't work out. I don't know. There's so many talented people involved. I don't know how these things right. don't work out. But Steve Bartek did the pilot. Episode 101, they want, uh, um, oh, my God, I'm blanking on a Stuart Copeland, Jesus, uh -huh. legendary drummer right. and composer. They want him to do episode 101, and they want you to do episode 102, and then we're going to pick. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. So I scored. Yeah. So I scored episode 102. And the first cue in the episode is the, the, my demo. I just used it. Right. Um, and then I got a call saying, there's good news and bad news. Good news, you, you got the show. The bad news is you got the show, and <laughs> you better get going, because we got a lot of episodes. So that's uh, that's how I stumbled into that show. And but you didn't know it was going to be the next several years. I had no life. idea. No. Okay. No, that was great, because Michael uh, and all the producers, Mark, they were all really supportive of the music. Because it was such a big part of the show, yeah. and they, they, uh, I think it was Michael who pushed to have live musicians, which was not being done at that time as much. Yeah. And so we had a group of seven players who came to the studio every week, and you know we became a family over eight years. You know, sometimes certain players couldn't make it, so we had to get a, a, a fill-ins. But we had a group that was always. Yeah. Almost always there, and it was really fun to do. It was just we joke around half the time, but and yeah, I don't. I, it, that again, that's all a blur. The eight years, it doesn't seem like eight years, but it was. Yeah, that's crazy. It goes, but it was uh, it was a very fun show to work on in between like Transformers or. Yeah, it must have been hell scheduling. Wise. It was hell. It was bad. It was yeah hell. <laughs> I don't know. You know how to say worse than hell, but it was hell. <laughs> but. The, the good thing about it was you could work on Transformers. I could work on Transformers throughout the day and go do a couple scenes with Terry Hatcher goofing off. And so it's yeah. so different that it it was kind of a nice thing to do at night. Are you, you know? able to, like, switch your brain like that to go to uh, something really yeah. super intense and then be like, oh, yeah, nice little bit lighter comic kind of Yeah, it didn't drama. seem to be that big of a deal. 
just because you had to do it. <laughs> I had no choice. <laughs> right. But, uh, but no, I, I'm grateful for my eight years on that show. It was a yeah. lot of fun. Uh, yeah, it's amazing work, too. It's... And the TV is intense, and I, I haven't really taken any other TV stuff because it's so... The schedules are just crazy. That, schedules and films are crazy, too. But right. That, but like, yeah. you'll get an episode and need to turn it over in three days. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and that you just got to crank it and, you know. <laughs> but but if friends ask me to do shows I'll I'll do them but yeah but uh so kind of uh but between your work and everything uh what do you do uh, to re- creatively refresh like kind of what are your hobbies like do you like to travel mm, do you question. like to go fishing i mean right. i know you you have a family you just had mm-hmm. a baby and mm-hmm. and how's everything going there how's it being great. dad, how's she, dad oh, life? i love it <laughs> she's two and a half now she's great she's now if I'm not working, that's what I'm yeah, doing, yeah, hanging out yeah, with her. Yeah, that's a full-time job, yeah. It is. Before that, I used to exercise a lot and go, my now wife and I used to go hiking with the yeah. dog and just do things that are opposite of studio. Yeah. and crammed inside, and go, yeah. yeah. And go traveling <laughs> to Europe and all these great places. And uh, But yeah, now it's, it's all about the kid. Yeah. And I don't watch movies as much as i used to i'd like to get more back into that mm. i'd feel i know there's some people who don't really watch anything and they do you yeah. try to watch what other people are doing and what other directors and filmmakers no are doing? Is that... i i have a very uh when i was growing up i would see anything and everything now i feel like my taste i feel like i'm an old fart <laughs> but my taste is like uh, very narrow and what are you watching now what are your tv shows that year you're, you're binging now oh <laughs> uh Let's see. The only two shows I really watch are Silicon Valley and Vice President. Oh, Vice President. Vice Principals. Vice Principals. My good. Show. Yeah, my good friend. So good. I love but, it. Me and my wife watched that. It was so great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Season two is coming up. Uh, I've been emailing David Gordon Green, who's a part of that. Yeah. Just saying, hey, uh, he's going to invite me to the premiere if they have one. Yes, that's awesome. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's. There's so many great shows, and like I've seen, I saw one episode of Game of Thrones, and I'm like, oh, it's just not for me. And <laughs> but I know people are ravenous for it. Ravenous, I, yeah. It's come back this Sunday. It's, it's yeah, <laughs> I know. It's like I can't not get, I can't get away from it. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know that I, I have the energy or the time to delve into it's that. It's like homework sometimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like you start a season, it's like how many episodes are left? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I probably won't jump into that one but yeah i'm just i just literally watched the last episode of silicon valley a couple days ago yeah i'm behind and gonna watch uh oh yeah tw- i was telling you before we started this twin, uh, peaks. twin peaks i loved the original show or at least up to a point i think i stopped watching at a certain point but yeah. i watched a bit of the first episode this morning which is like <laughs> really out there and that's exactly what i was hoping for so yeah <laughs> i'll finish it tonight with when my daughter goes to sleep i guess uh maybe that'll be the next show i guess i'll watch twin peaks and then just in time for uh vice principals to come back but yeah when, when i'm working i don't watch anything yeah i mean you don't have time yeah <laughs> no your brain your your i guess i feel like brain energy you have to focus it in a certain place you can't mm-hmm. spend it yeah anywhere else right. um, no totally yeah yeah and uh but I do enjoy your films that you put out there oh, and everything, all your work that you've done. And I just want to thank you so much for your time tonight sure. and, and chatting. It's been on. so informative and enlightening. So oh, great. Awesome. God. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>